And of course, this is a fascinating disease that dates back to um, the time of Thomas Hodgkin when he described seven patients in the literature uh, that had ultimately a diagnosis consistent with Hodgkin lymphoma. And about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to visit his grave that said, here rests the body of Thomas Hodgkin, MD of Bedford Square, London, a man distinguished alike for scientific attainments, medical skill, and self-sacrificing philanthropy. He died at Jaffa the fourth year of April, 1866. And it's really remarkable that a lot of his seminal observations continue to be important to this very day. I'm going to mainly focus on the management challenges in advanced stage presentations of Hodgkin lymphoma. And I'll begin by emphasizing that most patients with this disease will be cured. Therapy is toxic. And the ideal, therefore, is a precision approach where you would limit therapy in patients with favorable disease and escalate therapy only when necessary. In other words, if somebody was not going to respond to initial treatment. Defining risk in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma is a challenge in 2021. And I'll emphasize that the original international prognostic uh, scale, the IPS-7, remains prognostic. However, the overall survival prediction has narrowed. Uh, recently, uh, a few years ago, based on a U.S. study, the IPS-3 was published, and you can see there is this one group in the uh, blue that has a decreased uh, overall survival. However, that group is very small. Only 3% of patients are in the high-risk group, and the remainder of these patients, although there's some discrimination, do reasonably well. Perhaps the most promising way of predicting outcome is not a, something at diagnosis, but the response assessment using PET. And of course, the original publication by Gallimini demonstrated that patients who were PET positive after two cycles of treatment had poor outcome whether or not they had high risk clinical disease, whereas patients who were PET negative had good outcome, again, whether or not they had high risk disease. And based on that, several studies uh, were brought forward that were using PET adaptation, some of which were listed here. And these studies really demonstrated, at least on the initial evaluation, some improvement in outcome as compared to historic literature. I'll briefly review our S0816 clinical trial, which enrolled patients with newly diagnosed advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. This was a single arm study where all patients got two cycles of ABVD. Patients who were PET negative continued with four additional cycles of ABVD. Patients who were PET positive were escalated to the escalated Bayakop regimen. And in long term follow up, now with the median follow up of more than six years, you can see that the five year progression free survival was 74% about 25% of patients had events. Now, important concept here is that the group who were PET2 positive and escalated to Bayakop did reasonably well. Those patients had a five-year progression-free survival of 66%, as shown on the left-hand side of the slide. However, on the right-hand side of the slide were those patients who were PET negative. And despite being PET negative after two cycles, those patients had a five-year progression-free survival of only 76%. Cumulatively, the number of events was significantly more in the PET-negative group than the PET-positive group because the majority of patients are in that group. The five-year overall survival is excellent, demonstrating salvageability of this situation. And we would conclude that response-adapted therapy appears to improve overall outcome over historic ABVD. The majority of the PFS events are occurring in the PET-negative patients, which really means that even if you could cure every PET-positive patient, you would not fix the underlying problem of relapse Hodgkin lymphoma. We tried to look a little deeper in this study and leverage a 27-gene correction, a 23-gene assay that had predictors of outcome in Hodgkin lymphoma. 
However, this did not appear to predict those patients who were going to have early events compared to those who did not. So we were really not successful at identifying those patients at diagnosis who were destined to become PET positive. A similar trial, which uh, asked a similar question, was the RAFL trial, where patients got two cycles of ABVD. Those patients who were PET positive moved on to an escalated form of Bayakop. Those who were PET negative were subsequently randomized to either ABVD or AVD. And as people are aware, uh, we demonstrated in this trial that in patients with a negative PET, it was safe to eliminate bleomycin. Uh, and therefore, um, the standard is often to adapt therapy based on PET imaging. Similar to our SWOG study, the group who was PET positive did reasonably well with the escalation to Bayakop with a five-year progression-free survival of 66%. But about 20% of patients who ultimately uh, are treated with this approach will relapse, meaning that we still have to improve. Now, Bayakop gives a better outcome with more toxicity, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time discussing the Bayakop regimen in this talk, but suffice it to say that the three year and five year PFS with modern Bayakop is better than the. 79 to 82 percent that we've reported in these other studies. However, the toxicity is also more formidable, including significant rates of infertility and some increase in second malignancies. So putting all of this together, I think it's fair to say that PET is not the final answer for patients who are treated with ABVD as 20% of patients at least treated with a PET-adapted approach still relapse, the majority of whom are PET2 negative. So that brings us to the incorporation of new agents into the treatment paradigm. And I'll begin by talking about brentuximab the uh, People are aware that this is an anti-CD30 monoclonal antibody tagged to a tubulin inhibitor, MMAE, and the concept is, is that this binds CD30 on the Reed-Sternberg cell, the tubulin inhibitor is cleaved and released, and that enters the nucleus to disrupt tubular, tubulin assembly, resulting in apoptosis. And of course, in the relapse setting, where this drug was initially approved, this drug had a response rate of 75% as a single agent, with a 34% complete response rate, and those complete responses uh, had some degree of durability, where close to 40% of patients may have been cured with the treatment. The other majority of patients, however, who did not obtain complete response had relatively limited durability of this approach. This led to the Echelon 1 clinical trial that enrolled patients with advanced Hodgkin lymphoma and randomized them to six cycles of ABVD versus the AVD regimen plus brentuximab. In other words, substituting brentuximab for bleomycin. And uh, we've seen some long-term follow-up of this. The three-year progression-free survival was improved with the brentuximab at 83% versus 76%. And we now have five-year follow-up that was published uh, recently demonstrating a similar results with a five-year PFS of 82% versus 75%. Notably, there was no increase in second malignancies in the brituximab arm. And looking at both groups, there were significant pregnancies and partner pregnancies seen, suggesting that neither of these regimens contribute significantly to infertility. Neuropathy is clearly an issue, and the rates of neuropathy with both of these regimens were substantial. But if you take a look at the group of patients that had resolution of neuropathy, that did go up over time. And by five years, almost all patients had resolved baseline neuropathy. You can see there was significant neuropathy, though, at two years in the brentuximab arm as compared to the ABVD arm. So putting this together, arguments in favor of the AVD brentuximab regimen is the improved progression-free survival, the fact that it does not re 
require response adaptation and that it eliminates bleomycin and it avoids escalated BACOP, uh, which allows you to include older patients. And this has been approved in the United States in this setting. Uh, arguments for the RATHL approach of response adapted ABBD is that it's less expensive and somewhat less toxic. Uh, the Echelon 1 control was not response adapted and maybe it would have behaved better. Um, there's less long-term experience with upfront brintuximab, but I showed you that there's now five-year follow-up. And it does appear that uh, failures are salvageable in similar percentages. And very exciting, uh, just in the last few days, this was dated February 3rd, there was a press release by Seattle Genetics that came out saying that the Etcetris or brintuximab combination significantly improves overall survival in newly diagnosed patients with advanced Hodgkin lymphoma. With approximately six years median follow-up now, patients receiving brintuximab plus ABD in the frontline setting had a 41% reduction in the risk of death compared to patients receiving ABVD. Uh, we'll have to wait to uh, see more details of this at a future medical meeting and in a manuscript, but I think if this is uh, really documented, it really cements the role of the AVD brintuximab regimen as a standard regimen for patients with newly diagnosed advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. I'm gonna now pivot to the other class of drugs that's quite exciting in Hodgkin lymphoma, and that is um, the checkpoint inhibitors. And I'll remind everybody that uh, normally when this uh, PD-1 is bound uh, by PDL one uh, that turns the T cells off. But when we interrupt that binding with a checkpoint inhibitor, that turns the T cells on. And by turning the T cells on, they can have anti-tumor effects. One such regimen is the nivolumab regimen. And in relapsed or refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, this regimen results in a response rate of 69% with a high rate of complete responses. And this includes patients who have progressed after brintuximab and or after an autologous stem cell transplantation. Why is Hodgkin lymphoma so sensitive to PD-1 inhibition? Well, there's a genetic explanation, and that is that Reed-Sternberg cells exhibit frequent copy number alterations of the 9P24 locus, and that the genes encoding the program DEATH1 or PD-1 receptor ligands, PD-L1 and PD-L2, lie in this region. And you can see in this series that uh, almost all patients with Hodgkin lymphoma have evidence of either copy gain or amplification of PD-L1. And it results in the highest single agent response rate to checkpoint inhibition in any tumor type. Interestingly, if you take a look at the degree of genetic alterations and correlate that with outcome and PDL1 expression, you can see that um, the patients with the highest PDL1 expression and those patients that have the most copy number alterations seem to have the best outcome with checkpoint inhibitors. Obviously, there was enthusiasm to bring this regimen up front. And in this small study of 46 patients, you can see that everybody had significant decrease and the, uh, uh, you can see that almost everybody had a complete response where the blue is PET negative at the end of treatment. And this suggested that the ABD nivolumab regimen was well tolerated and quite at Hodgkin lymphoma. More impressively, you can, if you look at the progression-free survival, uh, you can see that models would not have experienced any. Another example of this regimen was an early stage unfavorable Hodgkin lymphoma. This gave ABD nivolumab either sequentially or combined, and both groups did quite well. You can see with high complete response rates, and uh, in this situation, um, in a more favorable scenario, safety was also demonstrated. And perhaps some the, of the most exciting data that we've seen in Hodgkin lymphoma is with the combination in, in a sequence of pembrolizumab, a checkpoint inhibitor, followed by AVD in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. 
these patients had both early and advanced stage disease, but as you can see from this PET scan, some of these patients had significant disease bulk, and all of these patients have remained progression-free. And this data were updated at the ASH annual meeting in December, and you can see that that progression-free survival curve remains flat now with a median follow-up of 33 months. And a second study of AVD with pembrolizumab was also presented with a median follow-up of 10 months with another outstanding progression-free survival curve. Obviously, this uh, combination, therefore, has great promise. And this has led to the development of a North American randomized trial that is currently enrolling patients, uh, randomizing them to ABD with brituximab, which is that echelon regimen, versus ABD plus nivolumab. And this is a straight up one-to-one -one randomization. Important features about this trial is that it enrolls all patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, and it includes a pediatric group of patients because it's open to ages 12 and above. So it includes both older patients as well as pediatric and adolescent young adult population. This is the first time all of the United States intergroups have collaborated like this around a Hodgkin lymphoma trial, and we're particularly eager to see these results. As of this month, uh, we've seen over 700 patients enrolled to this trial across all of the cooperative groups as shown here. And uh, in addition, the Canadian group, as well as some uh, groups in Australia and New Zealand are joining this trial. And I expect this trial will complete enrollment during the calendar year of 2022, but we will then have to wait a couple of years for appropriate follow-up before we get a readout. I'm going to conclude by just talking about some of the challenges of managing older patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, these data were just derived from the SEER, uh, demonstrating that for patients younger than age 70, which is 87% uh, of advanced stage cases, you know, their survival uh, is quite favorable. However, for the small number of patients who present older the age of 70, those patients really have very poor outcomes. And this slide uh, is reversed. Uh, this is really the top bar should be uh, patients who are under age 60, and the red is patients older than the age of 60. And in a recent uh, trial in the United States, this was the ABVD versus Stanford 5 trial, the small subgroup of patients, only 5% of the patients enrolled, who were over the age of 60 really had very poor outcome. And um, that has been recapitulated, and it's due in part due to comorbidities and inability to tolerate treatment, as well as perhaps some intrinsic disease resistance that we see in the older patient population. This has led to some more gentle strategies, and one is a sequential regimen where brintuximab midotin is given, followed by ABD, followed again by brintuximab midotin. And this was in a group of patients older than the age of 60. And this regimen was highly efficacious. However, I'll point out that by the end of the treatment, um, only 28 patients uh, were able to complete all of the therapy when we started with 42 patients. And a lot of those patients went off for adverse events um, or disease progression, really suggesting that only a minority of these older patients may be able to tolerate this regimen well. And particularly for patients older than age 70 or 75, more gentle and new treatment approaches are needed. Uh, we've looked at a variety of brintuximab combinations, starting with brintuximab by itself, then adding to carbazine, bendamustine, and nivolumab. And all of these regimens give a very high response rate, as you can see from the first line here, including reasonably high complete response rates. This is the most representative of the regimens that's tolerated reasonably well, um, the brituximab plus decarbazine regimen. Very high response rate. However, as you can see, these responses are not particularly durable. And the median of this is only at about 18 months, which was somewhat disappointing given the high response rate. And if you look across all of those regimens, you can see that there seem to be events in all of the uh, regimens that are occurring. The follow-up of the brituximab and nivolumab is still relatively short, 
and that may be a bit better, but there still seems to be a number of events. There was a second trial of the brintuximab and nivolumab combination as upfront treatment in a group of patients with a median age of 71. Uh, the overall response rate was only 61% with 48% CRs. There was significant toxicity of neuropathy associated with the brituximab, as well as some pancreatic and LFT abnormalities. And you can see again that the durability was somewhat disappointing and similar to our observation, the median progression-free survival was only 18 months. So putting all of this together, if we were to say where are our new advances in Hodgkin lymphoma, I would say that most patients are cured. The burden of late effects mandates a precision approach. However, such a precision approach has remained elusive. And we continue to look for new ways to try to prognosticate and predict for outcome in patients. Um, it is possible that new features of PET imaging, like metabolic tumor volume, may be very helpful in this regard. And uh, we look forward to new studies that uh, validate some of these early findings. The second conclusion is that early incorporation of checkpoint blockade is an exciting direction in Hodgkin lymphoma. There's underlying genetic rationale. There's significant impact of this on the microenvironment, which could be very favorable. And we may have some predictive biomarkers on which patients are most likely to respond to such an approach. We hope that the currently enrolling 1826 trial, that's the AVD brituximab versus AVD nivolumab, may define a new standard of care for most patients with advanced stage disease. And we look forward to seeing that trial uh, completed and those results uh, be released. And then finally, I emphasize that older patients have inferior outcomes and need a dedicated approach. Brintuximab combinations are a start. And with that, I'm going to conclude. I'm unfortunately not able to take questions, being in a different time zone and being far away. But I again thank you for your attention and for this opportunity, and hopefully we can meet in person sometime soon.